Yeah, thank you. Right, so as mentioned, this is the second part of a two-part talk. James uh, last week outlined a lot of the sort of the basic background uh, of the problem. And I'm gonna be diving into some of the nitty gritty details today. So let's start with the basic setup. So our goal is to take some set that we're interested in counting the primes in and uh, the tools we're going to be using are these type one and type two bounds. The type one bounds are the most familiar from the small sieve. This is the quote, uh, level of distribution of our sequence in arithmetic progressions. So we want the sequence to be nicely distributed in arithmetic progressions to modulate up to a power of X. Okay, so gamma represents the the power of X. And then we also want to impose these type two conditions, which is represented by a bilinear sum condition. So we have these arbitrary divisor bounded complex sequences, kappa and zeta. And we want this bilinear sum to be uniformly small over all choices of these two sequences. And the parameters theta and nu govern the starting point and length, so to speak, of the type two range uh, for Kevin, one, of the, Kevin, one of the variables. Kevin, you need B, the constant on both sides, the same one, and type one bound. Oh, uh, yeah, it could be. It could be the same one. I mean, B is is some oh. arbitrarily large uh, ah. constant. And uh, it, just for convenience, I could have used two different letters, but yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I can be you know troublemaker and choose B <laughs> that will not be sufficient. I think. Anyway, I, I I understand it's just arbitrary constants here and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These this this just some big constant here and some big constant here. Yeah. So, so this is these are the main tools, and the primary question is: given uh, a triple gamma theta nu, if we have these bounds, is it sufficient to uh, detect primes in the sequence? Can we prove using these that there are many primes? And uh, as a secondary problem, can we actually produce an asymptotic for the number of such primes? So as uh, James mentioned, we have a new method, a new approach to this problem, which in contrast to the traditional, uh, well, not traditional, but the, the modern Harman sieve is non-iterative. So we're in a sense deploying all the type one and two information at once. Now I'm gonna give a very short, rough idea of how this is done. And we're gonna start with this uh, famous Linux identity for lambda n over log n. So lambda is the von Mongolt function. And so this is essentially the indicator function of primes on the left, if we ignore the prime powers. And on the right, we have this uh, multiple sum, uh, this uh, divisor sum where each of the divisors here is at least two. So as a first step, uh, I'm going to look at this quantity I call Wn, which is a normalized indicator function of uh, n being in our set A, and it's normalized to have average value zero. So counting primes in A is tantamount to essentially showing that the sum Wp is small. So our goal is to show that this left side is small. And uh, so I first, uh, ignoring prime powers, so this is not quite technically correct, uh, then we replace uh, the condition that P is prime, we sum over all the n's, that is the n's from x to 2x, and then put this uh, multiple divisor sum on the right side. Now it turns out that the type one information is enough to eliminate from the multiple sum on the right side, all terms that for which some divisor d sub i is bigger than x to the one minus gamma. 
And the reason is because the cofactor is less than x to the gamma, essentially. And we can then deploy the, the type one bound to get rid of those terms. Okay, so I've highlighted in red the new condition on the sums. So there we're using essentially all the type one information. And the type two information allows us at the second stage to remove from consideration all integers that have a divisor in this type two range here, x to the theta to x to the theta plus nu. So we're left with a sum over n in some set u. So it has this, uh, this divisor restricted condition. And also one can notice that in this sum here, all the di's are at most x to the one minus gamma and therefore this sum is only supported on numbers which are x to the one minus gamma smooth. So in, in, a, in a very uh, rough form, this is uh, a formulation of our new method. So the, the nature of this set script U is very important. So I will, so the, the conclusion from the previous slide is, is uh, repeated here on the top of this slide and the definition of the set U. So one corollary is, let's suppose that U is an empty set. There are no such integers. Well, then the right side is an empty sum. And we conclude then that the sum over primes of WP is very close to zero. Now, uh, recalling from the previous slide what the definition of WN is, we'll just uh, sum that over uh, all the primes. So the first term is the number of primes in our set A. The subtracted term is then a weighted sum or a weighted count of all the primes from x to 2x. Of course, from the prime number theorem, we have a very good understanding uh, asymptotically of what this quantity is. And we conclude then that the number of primes in our set is asymptotic to, say, the number of elements divided by log x, which is, let's say, the, uh, the naive guess as to uh, how many primes would be in the set. Okay. Now I am, you know, for, for the experts in the audience, I am uh, sweeping under the rug various local considerations, right? The, the act, there, there actually should be maybe some constant here coming from a singular series, but I'm going to ignore those uh, issues for the moment. Right. So this is what happens if the set U is empty or, or super tiny? But what happens if the set U is not very big? Or sorry, is, is not too small. So it, it is large. So what happens if U is large? It turns out that we can, via a new construction method, we can find sets A for which the expected asymptotic fails. So then we actually have a, a stronger conclusion that the, the, the asymptotic is guaranteed from the type one and type two bounds if and only if the set U isn't too small. Uh, well, okay, wait a minute. The asymptotic, okay, there's something wrong with this sentence here. Uh, okay, let me make a correction here. <laughs> if and only if the set U is, you know, empty or very tiny. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, that's a rather important uh, fix there. All right, I will uh, correct those when I post the slides. So what about these constructions that I just mentioned? Well, for a number of purposes, we need to construct sets A that satisfy the type one and two bounds but with the number of primes in the set being unusually large or small, okay, unusual compared with the naive guess or naive heuristic for how many primes should be in the set. 
Okay, one, one application is, as I mentioned, is that the asymptotic is not guaranteed when the set U is substantial. Okay, I'm purposely being a little vague here, but also for some parameters, gamma, theta, nu, it's possible to construct such sets so that there are no primes at all in the set. They set aside the type one and type two bounds, but have no primes at all. That's another goal. And lastly, to show that certain sieve bounds that we have obtained, which is which results in a lower bound on the number of primes in the set, well, we can complement those with constructions to show, to show that those bounds are best possible. So these are the three main goals of uh, the uh, a method of construction. And I'm going to be focusing today on the second of these, that is to show that for some parameter ranges, there are sets A that satisfy these bounds, but do not have any primes at all. Right, And this is one of the main theorems from our first paper, which we posted on the archive back in August. So this is one, one theorem we can prove, and I'm going to be going through uh, in some, some detail how this is done. So for every gamma less than one, there is a positive nu, so that no matter what the theta is, there are examples of sets satisfying type one and type two, but having no primes. So remember that gamma is the parameter that governs how strong the type one information is. Theta governs the beginning of the type two range and nu is a measure of how wide our type two range should, uh, uh, should hold in. Now it's useful at this point to recall a very famous example of Selberg. So the set of all integers from x to 2x that have an even number of prime factors. And by that, I mean counted with multiplicity. So this includes squares of primes and so on. So this, by relating this to the Liouville function, it can be easily seen to satisfy the type one bounds for any gamma less than one. That's essentially uh, from the prime number theorem. And of course, the set has no primes. Now, what this set does not satisfy is any type two bounds. Okay, so there's, there's no type two information here. And one can ask, uh, is it possible maybe to modify this? Uh, so we are going to be using ideas related to Selberg's example, but uh, the details are quite involved. So the first thing I want to do is show that we can enlarge our concept of type one and type two bounds to include non-negative sequences. And this will be sufficient to answer the question from the previous slide that, uh, to prove that uh, main theorem. And there is a relatively easy random sampling argument that will allow you to transition from sequences to sets. All right, so let's consider a non-negative bounded sequence. I'll call it V sub n. And I want V sub P to be zero at primes. I want V of N to satisfy the analog of the type one bound. So here I'm implicitly uh, imposing that V of N has average value one, right? If you take M, M equal to one, that particular term is just the sum of all the V N minus one. And then the analog of the type two bound is with a VMN minus one here in place of uh, a sort of a normalized indicator of 
of primes. Uh, oops, there's another typo. This is supposed to be an X over here. A little copy and paste error. All right. So these are the, the analogs of the type two and sorry, type one and type two bounds for a non-negative sequence. Now from a sequence, one can find a set via a random sampling argument. So if, if capital V is the maximum of V sub n, we'll just choose each number n to be an A with probability Vn over capital V. Right, and we do this independently for all the n's between x and 2x. Now, because, because of this first condition that Vp is zero at primes, this forces uh, this set to have no primes, right? The probability is zero to have any uh, prime in the set. And also one can fairly easily show that with high probability, this set A will satisfy the type one and type two bounds as I presented them on the very first slide. Okay, this, the type one and type two bounds for the set, right? So this allows us more flexibility in, uh, in, in our construction method. So the, the constructions we are going to create, uh, the V sub Ns will be very far from constant. They're gonna be very non-constant and they'll be taking real values. And uh, then we can use this random method to generate uh, a genuine set A that has the required properties. Now, it remains to choose wisely a, uh, a sequence V sub N. And it turns out that one should choose this in such a way that it captures information about the anatomy of the number N. All right, so I'm going to define it as one, say the one is the average value and then a function of the prime factors, but these normalized logarithmically scaled prime factors. So if N uh, factorizes into primes this way, uh, where I've included repeated factors here. And I'm gonna consider only little f's which are in uh, a certain set Okay, which depends on gamma, theta, and nu, but also depends on a parameter epsilon, which I'll introduce shortly. So one of the things that makes uh, it convenient for discussion is to allow this function to be a function of variable length vectors, right? So it could be a function that the vector here could be of length one or two or three or a million. Uh, of course, it's supported on vectors with the sum of components one, right? The, it's easily seen that the sum of the components here is equal to one. Uh, I'm also going to impose that there's no subset sum, right? The Meaning uh, there's no subset of these that has sum in this range theta, theta plus nu. What that ensures is that V sub n is one, if n has a divisor in this type two range. And what that means is the type, the type two bound for V sub n that I mentioned on the previous slide will actually be satisfied trivially because all the sum ends will be equal to zero, right? If I go back uh, here, right? If, if all these sum ends here are zero, then this uh, is trivially satisfied no matter what these sequences are. And the third condition on the support is for convenience to impose that all the components are at least epsilon, okay? That means that essentially that uh, the prime factors of n are at least n to the epsilon for n's uh, in the support of this function. Now, this seems like possibly a, a rather strong restriction, but in fact, it's not because if, if you know something about sieve theory, there's something called the fundamental lemma, which allows you to very effectively 
and asymptotically deal with numbers that have small prime factors. Okay, so we're not really giving up much with this condition. Now we also want to impose, okay, additional conditions on F. So these first three are about the support of F. Uh, just for convenience, uh, make these piecewise smooth and symmetric in all variables. So this, this last condition about symmetry is just for convenience because then it allows us to talk about the function uh, where we don't have to impose any inequalities on these primes. Okay, so these primes are in are in no particular order. And lastly, well, I, I mentioned that we uh, this condition here forces the uh, type two information or type two bound for V sub n to be trivial. Well, we need the type one bound and that is, is gonna be highly non-trivial, but by partial summation, essentially, this reduces to the following, okay? So if you take uh, any R greater than zero and any uh, component components C1 through CR, which are non-negative and, and have some at most gamma, this corresponds to the M, okay? So it kind of corresponds to the M where the prime factors are close to X to the power of C1 up through X to the power of CR. And then we sum over all ways of completing the vector into a uh, vector with sum of components one. If that, uh, sum of multiple integrals is equal to zero for all possible choices here. That's essentially equivalent to the type one bound for the sequence V sub n. So at this point, we have reduced the problem. We, we've stripped out all the number theory and we've reduced the problem to a purely analysis problem, which is to find a function which is which has this support conditions, the smoothness conditions, the symmetry, and then this uh, type one relation, which is the most daunting of all the parts of the, of the definition of this, uh, of this set here. And I wanna spend a couple more slides talking about this condition itself. Uh, one, very minor observation is that this set of functions satisfying all these conditions forms a vector space, right? The, the identically zero function for F uh, trivially satisfies this type one bound and trivial, trivially satisfies everything else. And you can see that linear combinations uh, also. Okay, so we'll, we'll make use of that a little bit later. Now, there were some additional conditions on the sequence V sub n, which I have not yet addressed in the context of the F function. Those I will write down here. So we want two additional conditions. We want F of one to be minus one. Okay, F, uh, this means we have a vector with a single component equal to one. Now, if you look up here at the definition, that corresponds to n being prime. So an n is a single prime where we have f of one. And f of one being minus one makes v of n zero. So that's one of the conditions we had on the previous slide. Okay, this is, this is crucial for forcing the eventual set script A to have no primes. Now we also want the uh, function to always be at least minus one. That ensures that V sub n is then non-negative. Okay, so we want F in this vector space with these, uh, with, with uh, F of one being equal to minus one and then these this uh, global inequality here. So I wanna spend a little bit more time on this type one bound because it's the most complicated looking relation and 
Uh, I mentioned that this is this forms a vector space, but it's not even clear from this relationship that there even exists a function which is not identically zero that satisfies this. Okay, so I want to at least convince you that the the set the space of functions satisfying this type one bound is actually very rich. There's a very rich space of functions there. Right, so here I've, I've uh, repeated the, the type one bound. I call this I sub one. And it's useful to split off the single term corresponding to K equals R plus one. So that means we are completing the vector here with a single component, which I'm, instead of calling it C sub K, I'll call it alpha. So alpha is then one minus the sum of the, the other components here. And then this multiple integral is actually a zero dimensional integral. So it's, it, it's just a single function value, right? Because there's, there's only one, there's only one variable here and it's, it, it must be equal to, to alpha. So when we take that particular term and then put everything else on the right side, we, we get this uh, equivalent formulation of I1. So I'll call it I1 prime, okay? So we have this uh, single function value on the left and on the right, we have all the possible ways of completing the vector uh, given C1 through CR with, uh, with at least two components. So now K is at least R plus two, okay? So here the, 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 the vectors are ordered and they, they must, uh, the, the new vectors have to sum up to alpha. Now there's several observations that can be made from this relation. And we, we think of this as a fragmentation of the component alpha, right? It, it's useful here to get a little bit away from the original number theoretic interpretation of this and think in, entirely in terms of this is just a function of a bunch of real variables. So the alpha turns into the vector C1, sorry, CR plus one up to CK over here. And these variables add up to alpha. So we replaced alpha with a bunch of, uh, uh, of terms that add up to it. So in a sense, we've taken the number alpha and we fragmented it in, into little pieces. And the right side represents all the different ways we can do that. The other observation is that because, uh, because of this condition here, alpha being the, the complementary variable is at least one minus gamma, okay? There's, the, there's this one minus gamma appearing again. And so what we've done is we've, we, you could think of this as a formula for the function when we have a component bigger than one minus gamma, and in terms of the function of uh, vectors you get by fragmenting that, that single component. Now, on the right side, there's no reason to think that all of these components will be smaller than one minus gamma. Some of these might be, again, bigger than one minus gamma, and we can then iterate this whole process. And we can keep iterating over and over again until all the components on the right are smaller than one minus gamma. And uh, here's, here's where this, this epsilon parameter becomes important because uh, each alpha can be fragmented only into a bounded number of terms because each term is at least epsilon. Okay, so that means this iterative process is finite. It's going to it terminate at some point. And when we do that, we end up with the following relationship uh, or functional equation or system of functional equations for the function f. Now this is really complicated looking, so I wanna walk you through the salient features of it. 
So on the left, I have separated the variables which are less than one minus gamma, by which I call beta one through beta s. Okay, those are the so-called small components. On the right are the large components, and I'm assuming there's at least one of them. So L is at least one, so there's at least one of these alphas. And on the right, we now have a multiple sum over uh, variables which are at least two. And these represent how many, uh, so K1 is how many components alpha one is gonna break into, K sub L is how many components alpha L will break into, et cetera. And then we have uh, this massive multiple integral where each alpha j breaks into uh, its components there. We have also that the, the new components are less than one minus gamma. That's a new feature of this formula compared with the one on the previous slide. And additionally, we have these extra factors, which are combinatorial factors that come up because the fragmentation process to get from a given vector to another given vector, there are multiple paths, uh, multiple ways that can be done. So these account in some kind of combinatorial way how that can be done. There's also these signs that come up. So this, these uh, factors can be negative, positive, or zero, depending on the nature of the vector uh, in, in uh, vector u. And they're very much related, or, or you could think of these as vector analogs of that truncated Linux function from one of the early slides, right? When we took the, the Linux identity, there was a big sum, a, a divisor sum on the right, and then we truncated the, the divisors. They were all at most x to the one minus gamma. Okay, so I'm not gonna write down the formula for it because it's, it's very complicated. But it's, it's, it, you can think of it as a vector analog of that. So what, what is the, the takeaway? The main takeaway from this is that on the left side, we have the function on a vector that has at least one component bigger than one minus gamma or greater than or equal. On the right side, these functions here are functions of vectors, all of whose components are smaller than one minus gamma. So the bottom line is, I can, we can freely choose the function on vectors whose components are all smaller than one minus gamma. We can define it to be anything we want. And then once that's done, okay, so I'm, I'm just uh, giving, giving that set a name. So this is the set of vectors whose components are less than one minus gamma. They add up to one and they have this uh, subsum condition. So once we've chosen F to be uh, on, on such vectors, it is uniquely determined by this formula on vectors that have some component bigger than one minus gamma. So this is actually a very rich set of functions, okay? Now I haven't addressed those inequalities at the bottom of the last slide, okay? I'm simply talking about functions in this uh, vector space, uh, script F that, that, uh, that was on the previous slide, right? I'm, I'm talking about functions that satisfy, whoops, uh, the conditions in this blue box, okay? So let's go back here. So F is then uniquely determined on the S. So that's a very rich, it gives us a very rich class of functions. Now, of course, um, we, we have these inequalities to, to deal with, which I'm going to uh, uh, talk about on the next slide. Uh, but this set, this set of, of vectors that has all components less than one minus gamma, sum equal to one and no subset sum in here, that's precisely the vector analog of the set U, the set of integers that was on the one of the very earliest slides, right? The set U was X to the one minus gamma smooth numbers, okay? That corresponds to components less than one minus gamma. And it had the, a restriction on, it had, 
restriction that none of the divisors was in the type two range. And that corresponds to no subset sum in, in this range. Now, the only difference is the epsilon. There was no, there was no uh, roughness condition on U. So the additional restriction that all the components are at least epsilon is something that did not appear in U, but it's, uh, as I said, it's not a big restriction and it will be very convenient for us. Uh, it's already showed its importance because now we have a we have this finite iterative method that produces this formula here. All right, so this is now starting to look really technical and really complicated. But again, the the main takeaway is that we can freely choose. Uh, well, I guess I I meant yeah. The main takeaway is here. We can freely choose f on uh, vectors with components less than one minus gamma, and then we have a formula for, for f on, on other vectors. All right, so let's recall the main goal of today's lecture, which is to, to uh, outline the proof of this theorem. So for any gamma less than one, that is for any type one information, there is a parameter nu so that no matter what the theta is, there are examples of type uh, of sorry of a set satisfying type one and type two bounds, but having no primes. Now it turns out there is another really really important reduction, and this was a key idea in our proof. The key idea was to first consider functions in a set which is a set of functions which is defined in a similar way but has no type 2 restriction right so the new here the new is zero which means there's no type 2 restriction and if we have a function in this uh, richer set this more this bigger set that has the following conditions, then we can tweak it to find a function that satisfies the conditions on the previous slide that would then prove our theorem. All right, now here, it, it, you, you can see there's a slight difference from what I had written earlier. Okay, for vectors u that have at least two components, we still want this inequality. But on primes, we want the function to be strictly less than minus one. We want that strictly less than minus one. Now, the, the idea here is to take this function f and create a function f tilde, which is in the, in the uh, more restrictive set, that then has the properties that we want. So, we want f tilde to be identical. We want it to be equal to minus one at one, and then we want it also to have this condition. So we define it. We first take it to be equal to f on this set, and I, I, I observe that this set of vectors here is a subset of the vectors you get by having no type two restriction. Right. In fact, here's a definite. Here's a here's uh, a relation. So R epsilon gamma theta nu is the set of vectors in R epsilon gamma zero zero with the additional restriction that there's no subsum. Okay, subsum is what I we call a subset sum. Okay, so this is yeah, subsum equals subset sum. Pretty good at writing here. All right, so when when uh, when nu is very small you could think that there's a very there's very little difference between these sets. And uh, on other vectors, we have uh, we define it exactly as on the previous slide, right? If if there's a if there are any components bigger than one minus gamma, we define it in terms of the function on components which are all less than one minus gamma. And what's what a crucial observation is that this red factor here, this fraction, is bounded. So it turns out that because, because there's an epsilon here, 
these combinatorial factors are bounded, and the denominators, of course, every factor in the denominator is at least epsilon. So this is bounded uh, in terms of epsilon. So it turns out that if f1 is minus 1 minus delta, then af after some analysis here using this crucial fact here, and also the, the multiple integrals are the, the re region of integration is also has a bounded volume. Uh, you can show that f tilde of one is smaller than minus one minus delta over two. So uh, that's not quite what we want, but the, the point is that moving from f to f tilde uh, causes certain small perturbations, okay? Very small perturbations. So f tilde of one is still a bit below minus one. And for all the others, since, uh, since f of u is at least minus one, small perturbation means we're at least, let's say negative one minus delta over three. So now there is a separation between, between this and this. These are, these are separated apart. And then uh, a little rescaling. Okay, why can we rescale? We, we, we can rescale because we're in a vector space. So we rescale it and to have f tilde of, to be my, equal to minus one, and then f tilde on all the other vectors will be above minus one. Okay, so that's, it's, it's a bit technical, but the main point is that we, we can succeed as long as we find a function in this richer set where there's no type two information. So it, it's, it's more convenient to work with then we can succeed with finding a function that does have the type two restrictions, provided that nu is small enough and small enough as a function of gamma only, okay? It makes the, the boundedness here is bounded in terms of gamma, not in terms of, uh, of theta. All right, so again, uh, here, here's now our new goal. Our new goal is to find a function in this uh, vector space where there's no type two information with these properties. And now it's good to recall Selberg's example again, because Selberg's example was exactly in this space, right? We had type one information, very good type one information, but no type two information. So what does Selberg's example correspond to? Well, because of the it, it, it corresponds to taking f of a k-dimensional vector to be just minus one to the k, which is which corresponds to the Liouville function. Uh, it also corresponds to epsilon being zero because we have no a priori lower bound on the on the prime factors. Now this so Selberg's example just barely fails. To satisfy these conditions, because we have we have the two failure modes. So f of one is equal to minus one. We need it actually strictly less than. Also, epsilon is zero. But it but it really begs the question: Is there some kind of modification or tweaking of the Selberg example that will then give us what we want here? And the answer is yes, but that tweak is very complicated and the complication comes exactly because of this really complicated looking uh, recursive formula here. So let me talk about what we use in the paper, which is a certain family of Liouville type functions. So they're defined, defined in terms of two parameters, C and epsilon. C, I think, is, is something which is somewhat large. Epsilon, I think of as super tiny. So if all the, com all the components are between epsilon and C, we'll just take it to be exactly like the Liouville function. So minus one to the S, no, nothing unfamiliar there. Uh, if there's any component smaller than epsilon, then We'll take this to be zero, okay? So that's a, a difference from the actual Liouville function. And when there is some component bigger than C, we'll define it exactly analogous to that really complicated formula on the previous slide. But now, because uh, at least in this range here, 
the lambda tilde function is, uh, well, the vector analog of completely multiplicative, we get some nice factorization. So the, the components which are bigger than C, we then have these, these extra factors corresponding to them. And uh, it, it's, it's now, instead of a multiple sum, it's a, a single sum over K. Uh, again, a multiple integral, but a slightly smaller one, uh, smaller looking, uh, well, sorry, a, sl a slightly uh, less complicated looking one. There are these complicated uh, combinatorial factors that appear in the numerator. Uh, they are indexed by C, so I haven't, I haven't told you what that means. But, but there is a, a nice formula for these. These are all uh, bounded in terms of, of epsilon and C. So there is a nice formula for these. And uh, because uh, we're defining it this way, the lambda tilde function will satisfy the type one bound up to one minus C. And in fact, here's a, here's a lemma. So if, uh, if C is it, it smaller than one minus gamma, then this uh, modified Liouville function does, satis does lie in the space we want. And also if C is a bit smaller, then there is a, uh, a tweak of it. So you, you create, in a sense, the completely multiplicative function uh, by multiplying the value at primes by two. So we get a factor of two to the K. So that's also in this uh, in this set. So last slide, how do we use these to prove the theorem? Uh, remember, this is our goal. We want to find a function that that's in this vector space but has uh, these properties here. And it turns out that one can, by remembering some of the number theory that went that went into this, this capital M function that I mentioned on the previous slide, which uh, is here, is actually very close to minus one. So this modified Liouville function is, in a sense, very close to the actual Liouville function. So it's between minus one and minus one plus some factor, which is can be written in terms of the Dickman function, the Dickman function, which comes up in the theory of smooth numbers. And this is really, really small if we think of C being fixed and epsilon being super tiny. So then C over epsilon is large and the Dickman function, because it decays faster than exponential, uh, if C is, is fixed in terms of gamma and epsilon is small enough, we can get you know, bounds uh, you know, we, we can show that this M function is super close to minus one. And as a corollary, uh, as an easy corollary, the lambda, these modified Liouville functions are at most one in an absolute value. And the sign corresponds to just the number of components, which, okay. So these, both of these properties are, are also hold for the actual Liouville function. And okay, this is the very last part of the last slide. This is the actual, function that we are going to use. Uh, so I take, here's, here's one of the Liouville functions with parameter one minus gamma over two. And there's this extra term in front, which has the effect of switching the sign when K is less than three versus K greater than or equal to three which is super important because at primes, we, have a, we, we need a slightly different behavior than when numbers that are non-prime. Okay, G0 is the maximum of this. And, and by what I had put up earlier, this is uh, the, the K here is bounded by uh, one over epsilon because every component here is at least epsilon. So we have a, a bound on G. And then our function F is given by we have another Liouville function, but this, this has parameter one minus gamma, and then we have this part. And the two underlying parts are have absolute value at most one. 
And one can check just doing some case by case analysis that this function f satisfies all the properties we need. Okay, so in uh, exactly because of this switching of sign of the g function, so we 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 consider k odd and even separately, and you just you just work it out. I'm not, I, you know, this this will be on the on the posted slides. Uh, when if if there's any component less than one minus gamma, of course the g function is zero, and and this function will be. Um, I actually actually I think f of f of u is also zero. <laughs> If there's any component uh, in this range, uh, the 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 key one is f of one. So it turns out that when we have a single component, so here k is equal to one, then uh, both of these components are negative and they conspire to push the value just barely below minus one. Okay, so again, this is rather complicated. But these modified Liouville functions uh, put together in the right way uh, are going to give the kind of function that we want. Okay, And that then, via all the previous reductions, completes the proof of our main theorem. All right, so I think I'll stop here.